This is definitely a pulpit for a tall preacher, of which I'm not one. Well, I'm happy to be here with you all this evening and for this week. And I hope at the end of it, you'll be happy I was here with you. <laughs> but if you're not, because I wasn't you. Uh, <laughs> let's have a word of prayer together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to meet together in this land where we have this freedom to do so. And thank you that we have a book that we can open that you gave to us in our language so that we can read about you. Now, we ask that you would uh, consecrate these days of meeting together as we look upon the subject of missions. As your son glorified you and lifted you up, we pray that we'll be able to do that for him and in doing so to lift you up as well. Please guard our thoughts, our speech, everything as we delve into your word to learn more about missions, how we can be more effective in it according to your plan. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, my name is John. Um, happy to be here in Colorado. This, I think, is my second time in your state. Uh, but the first time was before half of you were born, so we won't count that. Uh, I am getting older now. I know I still look good, but I'm getting older. Yeah. <laughs> my wife says I look really good, but she wears glasses now. Uh, and besides, I pay her to say things like that. But uh, I have uh, was saved at the age of five. I'm from Georgia, by the way, um, the home of the Atlanta Falcons, I might add, uh, where we have real football. Uh, you, know, you know, our football players are not comedians like some teams, but, uh, but that's okay, you know, God will help you. <laughs> uh, let's let's stick to the Word of God tonight, okay? <laughs> uh, but um, I was uh, saved at age five at First Baptist Church in Cartersville, Georgia. I still remember it. It's about the only thing I remember from age five, but I do remember that. Uh, called to missions at age eleven. And so missions has been a part of my life ever since. It's all I've ever cared about. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Uh, so you might think or say I'm just a freak when it comes to that. I mean, missions is all I've ever lived for. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Uh, it's the only thing I know how to do. Uh, and I've been doing it for, I think, 34 years now. So that was after pastoring for a while and serving as assistant pastor. I did go to Howells Anderson. I was youth pastor for Curtis Hudson for a little bit. He was my mentor, my primary mentor as a pastor. Um, uh, I miss him like his family does, but uh, I'm thankful for the influence he had on my life. Uh, I started a church in New York City area right out of college. Started two churches in Los Angeles in parks, street preaching. I'd go out on Sundays and preach to about 1,500 people every Sunday in the parks in L.A. And we ended up, when the weather would get bad, having to find a place to put them into and so uh, there was a church nearby and we eventually merged with those with that church uh, then I left to go into the missions full-time serving the Lord in this way so I've been doing this since uh, 86 full-time in fact since this month September 1986 this was the month that my life was changed because it was in this month in an event in Thailand that something happened to me where I realized that everything I thought about I thought that I knew about missions just went out the window. My whole life as a Christian, I'd been in church all my life. I was less than a week old when I first went to church. So church was all I had known. Serving the Lord was all I'd known. Started winning souls in jails in Georgia when I was 12 years old. Uh, street preaching when I was 15 years old. Bus ministry, 15 years old. So ministry is all I've ever known. Kind of like uh, the one in the Man, I'm getting old, so I'm forgetting things. Who was in the Bible that was taken to the temple by his mother, Hannah? Samuel. I, I wanted to say Joseph. I knew that wasn't right. I do know some things about the Bible. I'm just forgetful a little bit now. You, you, I'm just forgetful a little bit now. I'm just forgetful a little bit now. Uh, so <laughs> I'll try not to repeat myself too much. But if I do, just increase your love offering. It'll make me feel better. 
I say that to say this, and I have plenty of opportunity to share a lot with you all. My purpose in being here is to help open your eyes and broaden your understanding about what missions is from a biblical standpoint. If I ask you all now, and I won't do it, but if I ask you right now to close your eyes and imagine a missionary in your head, what does a missionary look like? When I was growing up, you think about some guy dressed in khakis with a pith helmet, walking through the jungles with a machete in his hand. That was the missionary. Well, those guys died of old age 50 years ago. Uh, th they're not around anymore. Now we fly, we drive cars, we have iPhones. Uh, missions is done a different way now, and that's a problem. Because in most cases, we're no longer doing missions work. We call ourselves missionaries. You call us missionaries because that's what you've been taught to call us. But we're not missionaries anymore. When I was in Thailand on my first, one of my first, well, maybe it was my first trip there, I found myself in a remote village of people who had, didn't know the world was round, had never heard of America, thought it was the village that I came from. Uh, they had never seen a white man before. They have never seen a black man either. All they knew was other men that looked just like them, little Asian men. They didn't even know that other men of color existed. When I first walked into their village, they came out to kill me. The women were screaming. The children were screaming, running around. The men came out from their huts with these big, long machetes they used to harvest rice with to kill me because they thought that I was an albino monkey. <laughs> I was scared. I had some what we call national preachers with us who took me there, and they were going to translate for me. And one of them said, you need to start preaching. I said, what did I preach to? He said, just preach. And so I started preaching, and when they heard me speak, they kind of stumbled. Like they never heard a monkey talk before. Yeah. But then when I began to preach, for some reason I preached from the book of Revelation instead of the book of Genesis. And I began talking to them about the streets of gold in heaven. And when I did that, it's as if they had run into a wall. They just stopped. Their mouths dropped open. And that was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I stood there preaching to them for several hours. It got hotter and hotter, so we finally moved into a little hut. They crowded in. We preached till 2 in the morning, a 12-hour sermon. I was exhausted. I asked, can we stop? They wanted to keep going. But I had to speak in English. It was translated from English to Thai, from Thai to Akka, from Akka to Lahu. And then they'd come back to me to continue. And I had no idea what I just said. That was 15 minutes ago. I was in a village of a tribe called Akka. Down beneath them in the valley was a tribe called Lahu. They heard a commotion going, something about some albino monkey being there. So they had come up there to see it. But later, after we finally finished, they took me up to a little hut. We ate some nice roasted dog, some leeches, sticky rice, all sorts of good vegetables. And we had a conversation. And these older men were talking to me. And um, I asked them, I said, why were you afraid of me when I first got here? And that's when they told me the monkey story. I said, well, why did you stop being afraid? And they said, when you started talking about the paths made out of gold in the village where the Creator lives. Well, why, why would that make you stop? They said, we know that story. How do you know? Keep in mind, the Akka tribe at that time didn't have a Bible. They didn't even have a written language. It was all oral. Now, since that time, we developed a language form and translated the Bible form and so forth. But this was 34 years ago. They said, we know, we know that story. And they began telling me other stories. For instance, they told me that at one time, all men lived together in one village and worshiped the creator. I thought, well, I know that story too. I said, do you know the name of that village? And they talked amongst themselves and gave me the name in their language. And I said, what does that mean to my translator? He says, it's a village where the mustards grow. The Bible tells us that the Tower of Babel was built on the plains of Shinar. The word Shinar means mustard seed. I had just finished studying that as a pastor and preaching that in my church, not even a month before then. I thought, this is incredible. These people don't have a written language. They don't have a Bible. They don't know the earth is round, but they know about the Tower of Babel. I said, tell me more. They said, all men live together in that village and worship the Creator. But in time, we begin to displease him. So he came down from the skies, 
and he divided us into different groups, and he gave each group their own language. And, he, and one old man sto- spoke up and said, that's where the tribes come from. And he's right. He said, and then, then they said, and then he separated us, and he gave to each tribe a book about himself in their own new language. Now that, I'd never read in the book of Genesis. I don't doubt that it's true, but it's just not in the book of Genesis. And so I asked them, being the American entrepreneur that I am, you wouldn't happen to have that book, would you? I thought, oh, baby, I'll take that thing back and sell it, and we'll finance missions from now until the Lord comes with that thing. And he said, no, we don't have it. I said, oh, okay. And then he spoke up and said, our forefathers were careless with it. They allowed two dogs to get a hold to it, and they ripped it into pieces. And since that time, we've lost the knowledge of the Creator. And one of them said, that's why we call ourselves Akka. I said, well, what, what's Akka mean? They said, Akka means stupid. I said, you call you, that's your tribal name, stupid? What tribe are you from? I'm from the stupid tribe. <laughs> oh, wow. I said, why do you call yourself stupid? They said, because we've lost the knowledge of the Creator. Oh. I thought, you know, in our country, if somebody loses the knowledge of the Creator, we call them professor. They call themselves stupid. Isn't that incredible? They said, but when you came in our village today and you opened that book and started telling us about the Creator in the village where he lives that has paths made out of gold, we knew about that. So we want to know what more you could tell us because we've lost the book. We knew that someday the book would come to us again. Our forefathers told us that. And today, you brought the book to us. Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to teach you something about missions now. That was in September 1986. By 1995... Less than 10 years later, over 90% of the Akka villages in Thailand no longer worship spirits or demons or trees or rocks or rivers. They worship Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. In less than 10 years, they had already begun taking it to their Akka brethren who lived in Burma, Laos, China and Vietnam. They had become missionaries, taking the word of God out to their own people, and they didn't even have a word of God. It's whatever we could teach them, they would go and teach to the others. That was within 10 years, 34 years ago. But today, they're independent Baptist men going to Northern Thailand to be missionaries to the Akka tribe. There's 79 tribes in Thailand why don't you pick one that's never heard the name of Jesus instead of re-evangelizing those who already worship him? Now you say, are you upset about that? Oh, yes, I am. I'm a missionary. So anytime somebody does something wrong or stupid under the guise of being a missionary, it troubles me greatly because it affects my entire calling, my entire profession. The purpose of a missionary is to go and preach where Christ is unknown and perhaps even unnamed. Yes, there's people living down the street here who've never heard of Jesus. It's not a missionary's job to reach them. It's your job. My job is to go where Christ is unknown, where Christ perhaps is even unnamed. That's not your job. Your job is to win your next door neighbors to Christ. The guy who pumps your gas or whatever the case may be. That's ministry. It's not missions. Do you call your church nursery workers pastor? No. Well, it's ministry. What about your junior boys teacher? Is he called pastor? No. Well, does he teach in the Bible? Yes. Does your pastor teach the Bible? Yes. Is he doing it in the church building? Yes. Well, doesn't your pastor teach here? Yes. And you lead them in songs, right? Yeah, well, doesn't he do that? Well, why don't you call him pastor? Because he's not pastor. He's a Sunday school teacher. There's a difference. Just because you might be doing the same thing doesn't mean it's the same calling of God on the person's life. One reason we have not evangelized the world, and let's be honest, if we really wanted to, we could do it. That's right. We got, we got yeah. Polaroids in space now that have long passed Jupiter. If we can do that, we could evangelize the world. Absolutely. 
Right. One reason we don't is because we don't care to. One reason is because we don't know how to. And one reason is because we're pouring money into things that we think is reaching the world that has nothing to do with reaching the world. It's just doing ministry in other places on the planet. Right now, we have a big emphasis, big interest, thank God, finally, about the Muslim world. 1.2 billion people that until 20 years ago when they attacked us, we acted like we didn't even know they existed. But they were there all the time. And by the way, hold on to your seatbelt now. A lot of them are the descendants of Abraham. Just as much as the Jewish people are the descendants of Abraham. Am I anti-Semitic? Heavens no. But the Bible tells us Abraham had more than one wife, and he had more than one son. I mean, go back to the book of Genesis and you can read it. They were all the sons of Abraham. They were all promised, or in that promise that his seed would be like the sands on the seashore, like the stars in the heaven. The land was given to them all, but one son was given a specific piece of land. One son was one through whom the Messiah would come. That's what makes him different. But the others are still his sons. If you, were in, if you were Abraham in heaven today, wouldn't it burn your heart that we put so much emphasis on only one of his boys and we don't care if the others die and go to hell? How would that affect you? Well, why have we allowed that to happen? Because we're bad people? No, because nobody ever bothered to tell us they're over there and you can witness to them. We just assume you, you can't do it. There's always a way to do God's work. Amen. Sometimes it might require a little pain or whatever, but most of the time it doesn't. It's just a, it, all it requires is obedience. Well, I started with that one little story in Thailand just to tell you something. That was 1986. At the time, I was still pastoring, waiting for God to show me what he wanted me to do in missions. And that day he showed me. I realized then that I could spend the rest of my life trying to reach Thailand with the gospel. And if I'm really fortunate, I might make a drop in the bucket. But, on the other hand, I could use my time funding these preachers to go out and reach tribal groups whose languages I can't speak, whose names I don't even know. I didn't even know they existed. I didn't know where they lived. But these guys know. And so I decided with counsel and with much prayer that I would spend my life not myself going. And I thank God for you guys to get to do that. I'm quite jealous of you. But this is what God's called me to do. Not to go myself per se, but to enable others to go. You say, then you're not a missionary. Well, not. let me teach you something else about missions. Who's our missionary example in the scripture? What country was Paul called to? What are you all, a bunch of Akah? <laughs> what, what country was Paul called to? None. Oh, better, better put all of them. All, the, the idea of missionary going to one place and staying there for the rest of his life is a great thing to do if you can get away with it, if God permits it. But that's only been being done in the last two or three hundred years. Before that, a missionary went from not from point A to point B, but from A to B to C to D, back to C, over to E, F, G, back to B to solve a, solve a problem there. A missionary was constantly going around the globe. That's why when you read about Paul's first journey, his second journey, his third journey, there's dozens of villages, dozens of towns that he went to. He didn't just go to one town. He was never called anywhere. What about Macedonia? Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia. He didn't have a vision of a map of Macedonia. I'm not trying to be sarcastic, although I am pretty good at doing that. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying things in such a way to make you stop and think. Paul's vision was to a man, not to a geographical area. Missions, if you're called to go to New great, go to New Zealand. Wonderful. Praise God that you get to go there. What a beautiful country. I've never been there, but... I'd like to be there sometime. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. But missions, you, I think this brother's going to, he, well, you already said it. You're going to go to this place to start, then go to, over to this other, next town, the next town, the next town, and see how many places you can go in that territory. That's basically what Paul did. You say, wasn't Paul a foreign missionary? It really depends on how you look at it. If you stop and think about it, Paul was a citizen of what town? Antioch which was a part of what empire? 
Rome. Everywhere Paul went was part of the Roman Empire. Paul going to Thessalonica is like me from Augusta coming to Denver. It's still the same language, basically the same people, although y'all have, you know, inferior yeah. sports teams and all, but, um, but basically, basically the same group of people. You see, we've got a lot of conceptions about what missions is, but if you stop and look at them from a biblical viewpoint, they're actually misconceptions about what missions is. So if we don't really know what it is we're supposed to be doing, how are we going to do it? Unless we just stumble into it. Now, that was my introduction. Let me ask you to turn to Acts chapter 17. Paul has been traveling around, as you know, on one of these journeys, and he's going from place to place to place, preaching. He goes in the first few verses of chapter 17 to Thessalonica, and we find there that he plants a church by preaching, getting the converts together, beginning to teach them God's word. He starts a church, and then he leaves Thessalonica. How long was he there? Well, how long does it take to go into a town and start a church, for crying out loud? Six months? A year? Four years? Paul was in Thessalonica for three weeks. Three weeks. Look in the first few verses. Read them to yourself. He was there for three Sabbath days. It was one Sabbath a week. He was there for three weeks, and he left. Whoa, 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 whoa. How in the world can you go into a village, a town that's never heard about Jesus, and start a church and leave it in three weeks and expect it to survive? I don't know, but that's what Paul did. You see, we think you can't do that because why? Because that's what we've been taught in school. You can't do that. That's not how it's done. Nobody ever told Paul that's not how it's done. He listened to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, and he did what God led him to do. So three weeks, but why was he able to do that? Very simply, here's another thing. Until recently, we haven't been taught in missions. Paul never worked by himself. That's right. We were taught, go out by yourself, you, your wife, your 17 kids. <laughs> you know, we're missionaries, you know. Uh, you got to fill up the church somehow. Uh, we got the world's largest nursery. Uh, we were taught to do that. That's how you do it. And most of us failed. You know why? Because that's not how you do it. God, Paul never went anywhere by himself, except maybe to the bathroom. And if he'd been a woman, he wouldn't have done that. <laughs> the only time we find Paul going by himself was when he left Thessalonica. He went with some guys to Berea, and then he sent them to do something. And he went on to Athens and said, I'll wait for you in Athens. When he got to Athens, it's what I want to draw your attention to. Paul went out. He began to evangelize among the Jews in the synagogue. Gentile merchants would come into the synagogue in order to boost their business, become friends with these guys. It was a logical way to, to help your business grow. But oftentimes they were interested in these foreign gods as well. And so they came in, and one day they heard this tent maker from Antioch talking about God. And they said, you know what? we got a meeting up on Mars Hill tomorrow. Can you come? I'd like for you to speak up there. And so the next day he went up to Mars Hill. And we find that in verse 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. That's not a criticism. He's basically saying, You guys are really religious. I mean, you put the rest of the world to shame, is what he's saying. Why? Paul's dealing here in the, in the uh, arena, or semi-arena there at Mars Hill, with two groups of people, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans were basically, uh, how would you say, evolutionists, kind of? I mean, they believed in all the gods, but they didn't generally believe in a life after death. They believe in, this is all we've got, so make the best of it. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow you're going to die. That was the Epicurean viewpoint. Then the other people there were Stoics, and they would be kind of like uh, uh, humanists are today. They didn't really believe in God per se, but if there is a God, he checked out a long time ago. He moved on to some other place, and he may come back someday, but who knows. So just get the best out of life you can get, and don't have any hopes for anything in the future. Those are the two types of people that categorize the Athenians. Those are the ones Paul's excuse me, preaching to. So he tells them, I walked up Mars Hills this morning, 
and I notice you guys are really, really religious. Well, that made the Epicureans happy. didn't do much for the Stoics. Why does he say that? Verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now, Paul did something that I had to learn to do by experience. Nobody ever taught me to do this. Missionaries are the most undertaught group of ministers on the planet. Almost all ministry teaching is for pastors, assistant pastors, youth pastors, music pastors. And in many cases, don't even tell anybody you're planning on being a missionary because that makes you a traitor. After all, America's going to hell, so why are you going to go to the other side of the world to preach to anybody? So we're not usually taught things. And besides, who's going to teach us? People who've never been a missionary before? So what, what can they teach you? They've never done it. I couldn't teach a class on childbirthing to save my life. I mean, I was there for both of them, but I don't know how much I remember after I woke up. You know, it was, it was all over with. Everything was clean. I was in a nice, comfortable bed. And uh, you, you, you get my point. I really didn't pass out. I actually delivered my daughter. No, it wasn't amen either. It was... <laughs> The most horrendous experience of my life. <sighs> I, I tried to cut the umbilical cord with a butter knife. It didn't work. It didn't work. Thank, thank the Lord for a midwife. Uh, anyway, where in the world was I? I need the Lord now. Um, oh, He's, he's talking to them. Oh, I was going to tell you something we don't learn as missionaries, and that is this, how to present the gospel in a cultural way. In fact, we're taught that's wrong to do that. You know, God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Romans roll works here. Bless God, the Romans roll and work there. Everything is done by culture. Everything is done by culture. I mean, some of you, you know, my son-in-law is from England. When he eats French fries, he dips them in mayonnaise. What kind of a freak would do that? <laughs> when you've got ketchup, you've got other stuff. But it's his culture, Lord help him. Or as we say in the South, bless his heart. Uh, if he has one. Um, every, culture is everything. The truth doesn't change. But how you present the truth had better change. I learned in Thailand years ago to be able to tell like that if a church had been started by a national preacher or had been started by a foreign missionary. You know how you can tell? The building. If it was started by a foreign missionary, it had a steeple on it. And usually some stained glass in the front. If it was started by a national, it's just, it could be a storefront, somebody's house, front porch, whatever. To them, the location wasn't important. And certainly not how it looked. What was important was we have a place to get in out of the rain. We, have, we used to support a lot of guys in Vietnam. We don't need more. They don't need our help. Their economy grew. They wrote us and said, thanks for all the help. Give it to somebody who needs it. Well, we had 182 preachers in Vietnam we were supporting. Now we don't. I'm sad about that, but I'm thankful. One, they don't need our help anymore. And two, they were honest enough to tell us they didn't need our help anymore. Give it to somebody else who can benefit by it. But you can go out there in Vietnam in the highlands and you can find that they'll have their churches oftentimes out in the rice paddies because they don't have a house they can meet in. It's, it's too many people have accepted Christ. So they sent me once, or showed me a picture when I was there once, of one of their churches, and it was nothing but a rice paddy filled with stones. I mean big stones, not pebbles. The kind like you could sit on or stand on. And I said, what is this? And he said, that's our church. I said, what do you mean that's your church? That's a rice paddy. He said, don't you see the stones? Yeah, why are all those stones in the rice paddies? He said, that's our church. I don't understand. He said, we can't put all the people into a house. So we have church in the rice paddies. And because it's an all-day thing, we brought stones, and people put stones there, and they sit on the stone for the preaching. I said, well, what do you do when it rains? He said, we pull out our umbrella. Kind of a moron are you, missionary? You know, <laughs> ever heard of an umbrella? Do you not have those in your country? <laughs> you know what? There were over 2,000 stones in that field. No wonder they didn't have a house big enough to put everybody in. 
I've seen church buildings built by our national preachers in northern Burma that hold 7,000 people in bamboo buildings. It's incredible. They do whatever they can. Nobody tells them you can't do that or you shouldn't do it that way. What I found in my experience in missions is give them what they need from the Word of God, the doctrine, the encouragement, the motivation, and then get out of their way. Let them do it the way they do it in their culture. And that's what Paul did here. Let me show you. He said, I'm going to tell you about God. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now, Paul is halfway through his sermon. I am not Paul. And Paul was not a Baptist. He's going to preach a three-minute sermon, and that's it. But man, what he says, without you realizing it, Paul just reached out and grabbed the door of their culture and kicked it down. I'm going to explain to you how he did that. Back up. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Where Paul stood, he had a semicircle of people sitting there listening to him on a hilltop. Behind him was a panoramic view of Athens with the Acropolis. While he's speaking, that's what they're seeing. And I can well imagine Paul said, the God that made the heaven and earth, he doesn't live in temples made with hands. Neither does he need our hands in order for him to be worshipped. What's he talking about? You couldn't worship a God if you didn't have an idol of that God. The idea of just speaking to a God. Now, if you're in trouble, if you're drowning, you're going to call out to him. But you had to have an idol in order to worship a God. Let me explain that to you because this is going to blow your mind. Why did they need an idol? Because they believed all the way back to early civilization in Mesopotamia, all the way back to Noah getting off the ark, the pagan people of our planet believed that when you made an idol of a God, that that God inhabited that idol. Almost to the point where like when God made man on the dirt, on the ground, and then he breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. Remember when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, we always get turned up, uh, confused about how, what, is, what does he really mean? This is what he means. In their, in their mindset, an image was just a hunk of clay until the God possessed that image. Now, that image, follow me, that image is just as much the God as the God himself is. The essence of that God has moved into that clay or that iron or that whatever, whatever he was made out of. So all these images that they had there on Mars Hill, all these gods they had brought back that Alexander had sent back from his conquest, they literally believed that the gods in the skies were living inside of those forms. And that's why they would worship them. You don't want to make your enemy's God mad at you. So instead, they would make their enemy's God pleased with them by worshiping him. But Jesus says the same thing. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was what? The express image of the Godhead of the Father. You know that, that word image is the word icon? What's an icon? You know, if I'd asked that 20 years ago, everybody would say, I don't know, what's an icon? But now we know what an icon is because you got them on your phone. It's the image that leads you to the real thing, the program itself. Clicking the icon opens you up to the program. Jesus was the icon, it says, of God. You cannot get to the Father but by me. And when people today worship idols, they say, well, I'm not really praying to the idol. Yes, you are. You're on your knees in front of it, looking at it, talking to it. You're praying to it. You might want to excuse yourself intellectually and say you're really not. It's just a representation. Newsflash, idols have always been a representation of the one. That's why people go into a, a sanctuary to kneel before this idol, to light candles or incense or whatever, depending on the religion, because they need to have that face-to-face -face contact. In fact, whenever an idol maker, remember they say that Abraham's father was an idol maker? Whenever an idol maker would make an idol before it would be put into service, 
they would have a ceremony called the opening of the mouth ceremony. And by doing that, they would take a stick or something and they pierce the lips and breathe into it. They believed that that was the breath of that God going into that idol. Now it was that God. The opening of the mouth ceremony. Remember what our Lord said to the Jews when he was taking them out of the, out of the uh, Egypt? They were complaining. They had been dead, so to speak. Now he was going to give them life as a nation. What did he say to them? Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. He was giving them the opening of the mouth ceremony. And he was saying it to them in such a way that they could comprehend the message he was trying to tell them. And that's what's happening here with Paul. He says, God doesn't need our hands to make an image of him so that he can be worshipped. He doesn't need temples made with our hands so that he has a place to live. Remember the verse in the scripture, the Lord is in his holy temple that all the earth keeps silent before him. Do you know that historically, back to the time of the flood, that the temple was always the house of God? Now, sometimes in our churches, we say this is the house of God, and we know it really isn't. It's just something we say in our colloquial manner. But a temple was always the literal house of that God. The temple of Diana in Ephesus is where Diana lived. That was her, that's where she got her mail. The Bible tells us that God inhabited the temple there in Jerusalem and in the tabernacle before the temple was built. So Paul says, God doesn't need these temples made with your hands so he can be worshipped. Now look what else he said. Uh, he had made, of all, made all men of one blood, all nations meant to dwell on the face of the earth. The Greeks were prejudiced, you might say. They believed that anybody who wasn't a Greek was subhuman. And if you weren't an Athenian, you were barely a human. They're very, very, very prideful. Now Paul tells them all of us came from one blood. We know that from Adam, but they didn't know that. So he's educated. He's having to step on their toes to do it a little bit. But hey, they asked him, tell us about this unknown God. Why did they ask him that? Because here, here's the key. Paul, as he walked up Mars Hill, said, guys, I saw a lot of idols. You guys are so religious. It's incredible. But I also saw an altar. What is the difference between an idol and an altar? An idol is something you worship as if it is God. An altar is a place where you sacrifice. An altar is a place of killing, of slaughtering, of shedding blood. He knows multitudes of idols, but one altar. And on the altar was an inscription to the unknown God. Every other idol he saw either had the God's name on it or they knew who the God was because of the way he was dressed or maybe he was holding a lightning bolt in his hand or whatever the case may be. But in this case, he says, you've got an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. And uh, guys, <clears throat> I know who that is. <sighs> None of them knew who it was. Their daddy didn't know. Their granddaddy their great-granddaddy, their great-great-granddaddy. Those altars had been there for about 400 years, and nobody knew who the unknown God was. Nobody knew who he was when they put the altars there. But Paul said, I know who he is. Immediately, he had everyone's attention. It'd be like if I were to say to you tonight, I know where Jimmy Hoffa's buried. Now, you might not believe me, and a lot of them didn't believe Paul, but I got your attention. And that's what Paul did. He reached back in their history using something in their culture to open their understanding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what missionaries do. By the way, that's what everybody ought to do when you're witnessing to somebody. You don't have to just you. Do you know that you can lead somebody to Christ without using the Roman road? Did you know that? It's amazing. I mean, actually, people were getting saved before Ford Porter wrote the thing. That's a great track, but we get the idea if you're not using a Roman's road, then they're not really saved. Well, what? Where did you get that from? I guess Paul wasn't really saved. Let me tell you about the unknown God, then I'll bring it to a close. Hundreds of years earlier, there had been a plague in Athens. 
Most big cities throughout history would have plagues. Why? Because you've got 50,000, 100,000, half million, or million people living together in one small confined area with no running water, no enclosed sewer lines. Sewers just running on the street, people throwing their chamber pots out the window. You better, when you look up, keep your mouth shut. Disease just went rampant. So from time to time, you had plagues that would come through and kill 10%, 20%, 50% of the population. That happened in Athens in their history. And they began to pray and make offerings to all these gods that they worshiped. And none of the gods could stop the plague. And so they were at a wit's end. What are we going to do? And someone suggested, let's send for a wise man who perhaps can tell us who the God is that we need to pray to. Well, the wisest man on the earth at that time that they knew of was a fellow named Epimenides, who lived on what we would call a Grecian isle, but it wasn't part of Greece at the time. And they sent to him. They brought him on their ship back to Athens. He walked up there to Mars Hill, and they had a meeting with the Areopagus, just as Paul was doing. And they asked him, can you help us? He said, I'll do the best I can. Well, what do we need to do? He said, go out and get 14 calves, or lambs, I'm sorry, 14 lambs. Seven male, seven female. Make sure they're spotless, clean as they can be. Bring them back here and don't let them eat anything all night long. Well, what do you want us to do then? I'll tell you when that comes. Uh, I'm going to go take a nap. And he walks off to the side and goes to sleep. Very infuriated. We just spent a ton of money traveling to get this guy up here. He tells us to go get 14 sheep, and now he's going to take a nap? And somebody, they wanted to kill him. Somebody said, well, let's do, I mean, guys, what have we got to lose? Let's do what the man says. They went and got it, and the next morning he woke up, and they're all sitting there with these lambs. He said, okay, these look good. Did they eat? No. You told us not to let them eat. They haven't had a thing to eat since yesterday afternoon. Okay, let them go. Don't kill them. Aren't we going to sacrifice them? No. Let them go. And wherever they stop to eat, that's where you build an altar and you sacrifice them. Now, they thought, well, as soon as we let them go, they're going to all start eating right here. But no, they begin to wander throughout the city of Athens, and as one would stop, they'd build an altar and sacrifice it. They said, well, this is, by the way, the plague stopped. His request was not for money, but that Athens would make a peace treaty with his island, which they did, and they never broke. And then he went back home and lived there as a wise man for the rest of his years, lived happily ever after with his scrolls. Now, they wanted to make an, all, an idol to this unknown god. So they asked Epimenides, what's his name? He said, I don't know. I have no idea. Well, well we got to worship him. I mean, he saved our city. What would be a good name for him? He said, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Don't do that. Why? He's greater than all the other gods because none of them could stop the plague. All of them together could not stop the plague. But in one day, he stopped it. He's better, more powerful than all the other gods. If you try to give him a name, what if he considers that name to be insulting to him? Now he's going to turn around and bring the plague back on you again. And they said, oh, that's a good point. All right, we won't give a name, but we got to make an idol. He said, no, 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 no. Any God that's this great, do you really think you can make an idol of him that would be satisfactory for him with your human hands? And they said, well, you got a point there. Let's just make altars. So they made 14 altars around the city of Athens. And on each one of them, they inscribed to the unknown God. A decade went by, another decade went by. These altars began to crumble. Some of the city fathers got together and said, remember what happened here? We need to take care of these altars. So believe it or not, they actually put it in their municipal budget for the care and upkeep of these altars. But by the time Paul gets there, there's at least one left, and that's on its way up to Mars Hill. And he says, you guys have always wanted to know who that unknown God was? I'll tell you who he is. So he just sent... Three verses of scripture telling them about God, telling them that he lives in his own house. He doesn't need our hands. He made us all from one man. And then he said something else. He determined long before where we would live and how long we would live there. 
Does that sound rudimentary? Where did the Greeks come from? Anybody know? They didn't know. All they knew is they were there. History now tells us that part of them came from, they were actually part Jewish. Remember there were, one of the tribes was named Dan. He's not listed anywhere in the scripture after, pretty much after his disappointment. The descendants of Dan moved up to the north. One of them was named Dar. The son of Dan was named Dar. You ever heard of a place called the Dardanelles? That's where he gets his name from. One, name, one of them was named Troa, a great grandson. We get the name Tro, uh, Troy, the Trojans, from him. The Greeks didn't know where they came from, and now Paul's telling them this great God put us where he put us for the time he put us there. You see, Egyptians aren't called Egyptians because they live in Egypt. It's called Egypt because that's where the Egyptians live. You know, I hear guys sometimes say, I want to be a missionary to Israel, but they won't allow me to come in. But God's called me to reach the Jews. Move to Miami. Move to Brooklyn. Jews live in over 70 countries in the world. Most Muslim countries have Jews living there, particularly Iran. We support a number of uh, Jewish preachers in Iran. I won't tell you where, but there's Jews everywhere. If God called you to be a missionary to the Jews to reach the Jews, I imagine there are Jews living here in Denver. You don't have to go to Israel to do it. That's a cop-out. If God called you to do something, he's not going to call you to do something you can't do. If you can't do it, he'll call somebody to do it who can do it. And he'll give you another job to do it. So Paul goes on, he tells them all this. But here's the point I want to get across to you so I can finish. If God puts us where he puts us for the time he puts us there, have you ever heard of people, maybe some Pacific island somewhere or whatever, who've never heard of Jesus? Of course we have. Who put them there? According to Acts chapter 17, God put them there. Is God a Presbyterian? Did he create them to be burned? No, it's his will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Then how does this work? The very next verse will tell you this. Why does God put us where he puts us? That they should seek the Lord, if happily they may feel out to him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. In a couple of weeks, you ladies are going to get up one morning, your husband's going to be too lazy to go to work that day. You're going to go in the kitchen and start cooking a nice big di meal for him. Cooking turkey for the turkey. It's going to fill up the whole house with the aroma. He's going to be sitting there watching the Broncos lose to somebody. <laughs> saying, is it ready yet? Is it ready? And you're going to say, leave me alone. It's not right. I'll let you know when it's ready, you old fat, no good for nothing. Uh, finally, you're going to say, I don't know how. And you'll jab a piece of turkey with a fork and go and stick it in his mouth, thinking that'll calm him down for a while. But that made it worse. Now he really wants to eat more. So you call him to the table three and a half hours later. And uh, he sits there and he eats till he can't eat anymore. So he unbuckles his belt. Then he eats till he can't eat anymore, so he unbuckles his pants, and we'll stop it right there. Sooner or later, he's going to push back from the table and waddle back over to his chair, watch the Broncos finish getting beat by the Falcons. That night, he's going to feast on leftovers. Next morning, he's going to have scrambled eggs and turkey. For lunch, he's going to have a turkey sandwich, come home at night for a turkey casserole. After two or three days of that, he doesn't want to see another turkey as long as he lives. But the homeless guy out living under the bridge, he'll eat it if you offer it to him, wouldn't he? Why? Because he's had so much of it, he doesn't want any more. That's what Paul just said. Why does God allow us at times to be separated from him? In order to create a hunger in us for him. That's why the scripture says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Once you, it, it, I won't sound sacrilegious, but when I was growing up, we had the Lay's potato chip. No one can eat just one. And that was true. You couldn't. Well, you could eat one bag, but they were just talking about one chip and stopping. 
Once you taste of the Lord, you can't, you've got to have more. Or else your heart is so hard and you just reject what he's given you. And that's what missions is all about right there. It's taking the gospel to those who've been separated from it because they're hungry for it. Your pastor told me this afternoon how he loves it when he goes on the mission field to see the people so hungry to get a track, so hungry to hear the gospel. Why are they hungry? Because they've been doing this all their life. Wow, what is that smell? Man, that smells good. And then you come along and give them one little sliver on a track, and they want more and more. And other people seeing it want it, and others want it. Why? Because they haven't had it. But when your gospel's been there for a while like it is with us, you go, what is that? That smells pretty good, but I like pizza better. We want something other than what God's given us. Now, I've gone too long tonight. I won't do this on the other sermons. But I did this to try to open your eyes to help you understand maybe what you think missions is is not really what missions is. It's just a part of missions. Now, let's see if the Lord can open our understanding to see what we can learn and how we can better accomplish. How can you get missionaries to the field faster? If that's where you believe they need to be, why are we taking so long to get them there? There's a thousand one questions we can answer. But tonight, let's, let's focus on that. Father, thank you for allowing me to be here and to share these words with us.